Hello, this is Edith Neumeyer, and I am the author of the book, The Mystery of Adam. I want to really do another video about Matthew 24. I'm still seeing so many people that are confused and that are still continuing to believe in dispensationalism. But uh, I know I have done a video about that before. And, but I have a lot of new subscribers, which I'm really thankful for. And so I want to address it in this video. Now, does everybody know what dispensio, uh, dis, uh, dispensationalism is? Or another word for dispensationalism is futurism. So you can look it up on Wikipedia and find out quite a lot about it. Now, the basic understanding is that uh, the history of humankind is divided in different dispensations. And I don't mind saying that there is different sections or that humankind is divided into like 2,000 years each. But dispensationalism believes that in each of these sections that salvation was different. But when we look at the Bible, we can see that no matter what section we lived in, whether it be pre-Abrahamic or Hebrew time or Gentile time, that's what I call the sections, they, every time people were saved, through grace. Now, of course, in the Old Testament, people were looking forward to Messiah. They knew Messiah would come and take their sins away. Abraham knew that. They all knew it. Moses knew it. Now, God gave them, of course, the Mosaic uh, uh, covenant. And in that Mosaic covenant, everything was symbolic. It was supposed to remind them that really these animals could not take away sin. But eventually that Messiah would come and he would permanently take away the sins of the world. So, but dispensationalism um, is totally ignoring that and just goes directly to, um, you know, I don't know, but they are teaching false doctrine. They believe that the people, of course, in the Old Testament were um, saved through the law. But we know very clearly, Paul stated that so many times. If you read the letters of Paul, you know that no, uh, you know, the, the law cannot save anybody. It's only Messiah. And so that's a major thing. But the next major thing is end times. They have misinterpreted the Bible so horribly and put everything that is written in, uh, um, in Revelation as a future event. Even things like Jesus, the things that Jesus addressed in the Gospels that have pertaining to the end times, uh, they put everything, you know, in the end times. And I think a major uh, a gospel that is being used for this end time, for this false interpretation of end times, of course, is a Matthew 24. Now, Matthew 24, this false interpretation of Matthew 24, also is based on falsely interpreting the 70 years of Daniel. In Daniel 9, they seem to convince people that Daniel's 70 weeks have not been fulfilled. But that is very a major, major understanding. If we want to understand uh, Matthew 24, is the fact that Daniel's 70 weeks are fulfilled. Okay, that's just very, very important. Now, who fulfilled Daniel's 70 week? What was the Daniel's 70 week 
about. Daniel's 70 weeks was about the time the Jews or the Hebrews still had left before they would bring forth Messiah. Then once they brought forth Messiah and they rejected him, those 70 weeks were over. And of course, God already foresaw that. And so when um, the temple was destroyed, that was the end, actually the end of the Hebrew uh, section or the Hebrew time was over before 70. But as a result of them rejecting Messiah, um, the temple was destroyed. God showed them clearly, wait a minute, your time is up. You have rejected Messiah. Now I'm going to destroy the temple because I want to show you very clearly that the Mosaic um, covenant was over. And that is important, very, very important, you know, to know. Now we can find the 70 weeks of um, Daniel um, in Daniel 9. And it starts with 24, 70, 70 sevenths are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy place. Okay. And that is all about Jesus fulfilling once and for all the sacrifice on the cross. Okay? The Holy City to finish transgression, to put an end to sin. That's what Jesus did. He brought the ultimate sacrifice once and for all. We can read that in Hebrews, in the letters to the Hebrews. Um, and he finished everything on that cross. He defeated Satan and Satan was kicked out of um, heaven. There was the fulfillment of these 70 weeks. That's why the Jews only got the 70 weeks. Okay. Because Jesus prom, I mean, um, God promised Abraham to bring that he was uh, out of his descendants would come the Messiah. He promised the same thing to David. He said, out of your descendants, one of your descendants, and it wasn't Solomon, it was one of his descendants, will be Messiah. One of your descendants will sit on the throne forever. Not Solomon or any of the other king. No, it was Messiah. And so that's why the Jews had 70 more weeks, which were actually 400, uh, 400, seven times seven uh, is 48, so 480 years. They had 400 and four, 480 years to come back from the um, Babylonian captivity, even though God um, divorced them. Okay, understand that. God divorced them. God divorced the woman, okay, Judah and Israel. But Judah had that chance. Why? Because she had to bring forth Messiah. And of course, when you listen to my previous videos, just previous, you know, to this one, you can see that this woman, okay, brought forth Messiah. And when she has brought forth Messiah, the dragon was there and tried to devour the child. And that's in Revelation 12. So very important to know. So these 70 weeks were fulfilled. They were fulfilled when Jesus Christ was crucified that was half of the week, three and a half years. And then the rest of the three and a half years uh, is when Stephen was 
stoned. He proclaimed the gospel again clearly to the Jews, publicly, but they still rejected the gospel. And when they rejected the gospel and they um, uh, stoned him, that is when the time of the Hebrews was over. The 70 years was over. And after that, uh, the preparation of the destruction of the temple started. And it's very important to understand that because that's what Jesus, I mean, that's what Dan, Daniel is talking about. Okay. He's saying, no, understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the appointed one, which is Jesus, the ruler comes there. Uh, the ruler comes, there will be seven, 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 and 62 seven. It will be built with streets and a trench. So that he's telling you that Jerusalem will be rebuilt. Okay. But the end will come with the flood. War will continue until the end and desolation have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant and this he is not referring to the ruler of the people. It can't. It can only refer to the subject prior, which is Messiah or the anointed one. It can only refer. It cannot refer to a prepositional phrase. He is a singular uh, a pronoun and it can only refer to a singular subject so it cannot refer to the people and of the ruler is a prepositional phrase it describes who the people are so please read it in that way because that is extremely important that you understand the the construction of the english uh, sentences. A prepositional uh, uh, phrase cannot be then uh, the pronoun in the next sentence. Now, if this pronoun he in verse 27 refers to the previous subject, it would refer to the people. But it cannot refer to the people because people are plural. So it has to refer to the subject prior to that sentence, which is the anointed one. That is singular and that is he. And I hope people understand that. So he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. And in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. Who put an end to sacrifice and offering? It was the anointed one. Jesus died on the cross. He put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. He again. So the destruction of the temple was caused by Jesus himself. Yes, he may have used and all the forces that were going on during that time. And you can learn about that in Josephus. Okay. The, the Wars of the Jews, I believe, that's what the book is called. And I even believe in the fifth uh, book or something, or the seventh. He talks in extensive, I mean extensively, he describes extensively um, the destruction of Jerusalem and what happened with the temple. So... It says abomination it causes desolation. Now, this is the, the crux right here. Abomination that causes desolation. Okay? Until the end that is degreed is poured out, out on him. Desolation is the point here. Desolation is destruction. It is not somebody sitting in the temple. Okay, people? It is abomination that causes desolation. Desolation is destruction. And I know people are very confused because the main thing about this 
dispensationalism is actually also this teaching that at the end there is a tribulation. And I believe they say seven years. And during the seven years, the Antichrist will sit in the temple. And that's why they can preach that there is going to be a third temple, which is false. There is nothing in the Bible saying that there is going to be a third temple. Nothing whatsoever. I have looked at every time that temple is mentioned. Like, for instance, in Paul, Second uh, Thessalonians 2 where supposedly the man of sin is sitting in the temple. But we know from Paul that the temple that Paul describes over and over again is not a physical temple. Paul never ever said that the temple will be rebuilt. He told us that the temple is the church, that we are the temple of God. And that God is building his temple. He is using living stones, okay? Not dead rocks. And so when you understand that, then it makes even more sense. There is not going to be a third temple. Also, this temple is also mentioned. John was ordered to measure the temple in Revelation. Now I have to think where it is. 11. He was told to measure the temple. Every time you see the temple in heaven, it is, or every time you see the temple in Revelation, it is in heaven. Uh, again, do the study. When he was supposed to measure the temple and the people that worship in it, it is in heaven. That temple is in heaven. And who worships in that temple in heaven? It is the saints, the raptured saints. They are in that temple in heaven. And that's what he was supposed to measure. The temple in heaven. Not a third temple. So now, when we understand these things, that the 70 years of Daniel is fulfilled, okay? That there is no mention of an Antichrist. It says here that the people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Yes, this ruler of the people is the, um, the man of sin. There's no doubt in my mind. But again, even Daniel never mentions uh, Antichrist. Only John mentioned that in First and Second John. Okay, even that word Antichrist is made up by dispensationalism. Now, if you do so, some research to find out who came up with these ideas, you can go back to Schofield, Darby, and if you go even further, you get to a Jesuit um, professor of 1500 who was instrumental in. Um, working towards a counter-reformation. Now, I have done videos about it, and so I'm not going into details. If you really want more information on that, look up my videos or even leave a, a, a question in the comment section, and I'll give you where, if you know, if you can find it. I will let you know where those videos are, and I have done quite a lot. Look up dispensationalism and uh, you find those videos. But going back to um, Daniel, Daniel, the 70, 70 weeks of Daniel are fulfilled. And now when we're going to Matthew, that makes all sense, okay? Because see, again, they're using Matthew 24 to really explain or try to tell you that Matthew is talking about the tribulation time. No, Matthew is not talking about the tribulation time, this seven-year tribulation time. He talks about a tribulation, a great tribulation, but that great tribulation was in connection 
to with the destruction of the temple. You need to read. There's also another little um, book that I really advise you to read, and that's called The Destruction of Jerusalem. And I will put it um, in the um, comment. No, not the comment section, in the description box. I'll put it in the description box and you can really uh, read that little book. It is so important because the, the author, um, you can find it actually for free. But if you are not offended by who is actually giving it to you free, uh, it is maybe, a, 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 you know, um, it may be a, somebody that you may not agree with or the the, the theology or the uh, yeah theology will you may not uh, you know agree with but the book is really valuable why because it uses Josephus um, eyewitness account and puts it all together in a little book to describe what really happened uh, during the destruction um, of the temple and Jerusalem or before that in all the wars you know that the uh, um, the Jews went through during that time. See, Jesus wanted to tell, warn his disciples because the disciples would be still alive. Remember, he said um, a little further down, he said, this generation, and that's in verse 34, he says, truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. What is he talking about? Is he talking about his return? See, people thought that. People thought that's what he was saying. He would, they were thinking, well, this generation, but then, hey, the generation passed and Jesus did not return. So what generation was Jesus talking about in Matthew 24, 34? He was talking about the generation he was talking about um, on the Mount Olives. And that's the generation, the generation of the disciples. And he wanted that generation to be prepared. And he wanted to give them signs so they could flee from Jerusalem and not be killed like the rest of Jerusalem and the rest of the Jews. Because most of the Jews, most of the Jews during that time, that destruction, were killed people. It was such a horrible bloodbath. Um, and the people that were still, you know, young enough who, who could go into slavery, they would take them to slavery. But the rest of the people were all killed. It was a horrible, horrible uh, time. And that's why Jesus is talking about the tribulation of those days. Those are the tribulation he's talking about. Now, how do I know that Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple? It's easy because that's what Jesus was talking about. When Jesus, and it starts in 24, 1, when Jesus uh, was walking away from the temple, um, his disciple um, away, when his disciples came to him to call his attention to the building. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Now, don't you think, I mean, the, the disciples were bragging how wonderful the temple is. And Jesus says, this is all going to be destroyed. And of course, when they were on the Mount Olive, then some of the disciples asked him, tell us, tell us what will be the signs. Okay, we want to know when there will be a this be, um, you know, destroyed. Now, only one of um, the um, disciples, only Matthew, asked him two things. Matthew writes in uh, his gospel that they ask two questions. He says, one of them, when will the temple be destroyed? And when will he come back? When will be his second coming? But Luke and Mark only, okay, mentions one question. That is, what will be the signs 
of the destruction of the temple. So we know from Luke and Mark that Jesus described the destruction of the temple in detail because that's what he described in Mark and Luke. And so we also can assume that that's what Jesus described first in, um, in Matthew. In the first part of Matthew 24, he describes the destruction of the temple. And then in the second part of uh, Matthew 24, which is actually starts in verse 29, uh, when he writes, immediately after the distress of those days, okay? After the distress of those days, um, the sun will be darkened. Now we know from various Old Testament prophets that this is the sign of Christ's return or the day of the Lord. That is signifying the day of the Lord, okay? And then after that, he describes, um, even though he goes back again, we see that, of course, with, um, you know, I think it was, yeah, 34, truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. That still um, talks about the destruction of the temple because the disciples were alive when the, December, the, the temple was destroyed. Okay, so that, that has to make sense. But all before 29, he talks about nothing but the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem and is warning them when they see these things, they need to flee. They need to flee out of Judea. Okay. He says, so when you see Standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation. Did we just read that in, in Daniel? That is it. The abomination that causes desolation. Okay? Desolation, destruction. If they see that, run to, I mean, uh, spoken by Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee into the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down and take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will be taken place in the winter or not in the winter and not on Sabbath. For then there will be great distress or tribulation unequal from the beginning of the world until now and never be equal again. Now, this is important because this time was a horrible, horrible, horrible time. And he was warning the disciples to run and flee when they see any of these things happening okay, to flee. During that time, now it makes sense. Why? Sabbath? Because the Jews couldn't work on Sabbath, okay? So fleeing on Sabbath was pretty hard, right? They were not even supposed to take so many steps. Now, does that matter today? No, okay? It, it doesn't matter anymore today. Then he says, there will be many messiahs. Don't be fooled. Don't think that I'm coming back. There will be many messiahs during that time. And it was that way. You need to read Josephus and all the things he wrote. Um, you know, with the signs the Jews got, um, you know, before the, the destruction of the temple. The messiahs, the false messiahs and uh, you know, the false teachers telling them to even go on on the uh, Temple Mount because God will rescue them. And they went up there and all hap that happened was they were slaughtered. Uh, you need to read this so you understand that all this has happened already. All these things, the birth pains, all these are the beginning of birth pains. That is not about tribulation at the end, especially not 
seven years of tribulation. Paul and Jesus told us that all saints will go through tribulation. All saints. So even after the time of the tribulation that the Jews went through and the early Christians went through, they were, it says here, they were dragged in front of um, the synagogues and the officials. Um, that already happened. See, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. That all happened. He is talking to the disciples here. He's not talking about to anybody else. He's talking about to the disciples. Such things must happen, but in the end, it's still the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of the birth pains. All these things happened during the time between Jesus was, uh, you know, was raised from the dead and the destruction of the temple. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. He is talking specifically to the, um, the disciples. You will be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear. All this has happened during that time. And when you read Josephus, or even this little book that put all the things together that, Jesus, uh, that Josephus described, then you will understand what really, really happened during that time. And why these dispensationalists are false at this Darby and Schofield and all these people uh, that made up these false seven years of tribulation. Even if you believe in three and a half years of tribulation, it is false. It is absolutely false and cannot be found anywhere in the Bible. No place. All you do is you still have one foot in dispensationalism. That's all it means. Uh, you're still believing the lies that dispensationalism has been teaching now for a, quite a long time. They have been uh, misleading most of the Protestant churches because most of the Pro Protestant churches are teaching dispensationalism. And they have brainwashed and indoctrinated you to believe and I'm just hoping that most of my uh, subscribers, my viewers, don't believe these lies anymore. And I hope they have done their own studies to understand that all these are lies. And they are lies from whom? The man of lawlessness. Who is behind the man of lawlessness? It's Satan. It's the dragon. Because the dragon gives the man of lawlessness and the beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth its power. And that's why they are antichrist. That's why Martin Luther actually started this name and the reformers. They called papacy antichrist. Why? Because they are the man of lawlessness. And I, maybe he didn't want to come out and say, hey, you're the man of lawlessness. But he called the Pope the Antichrist. Um, and so the Pope used that word and used it in, or the Jesuit, or this um, uh, Francisco Ribera, I think his name was, he used that, who wrote a book in 1500 um, something, um, and used that word Antichrist. And he said that this word and this, this Antichrist or this man of lawlessness will come, will on the scene during those seven years of tribulation, which is nothing but a lie. And when you believe that, you're going to keep waiting for this false 
antichrist, a false man of lawlessness to come on the scene. But when he really, or when this false tribulation comes, then we are already in the wrath of God. Because this is another thing about this lie in Matthew 24, is that Jesus didn't talk about when he would come. He just told them generally, I will return when the, the days of tribulation are over. Okay, that means the saints are gone because the saints go through tribulation. So the end of the tribulation or Luke and Luke and Mark use when the days of the, the Gentiles is over, the age of the Gentiles or the time of the Gentiles is over. That's when the sun goes dark. So check that out again in Mark um, 13 and Luke 21. Uh, before the sun goes down, they say when the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. That's when the sun goes down. That's when the day of the Lord starts. Now, the day of the Lord starts with what? With Jesus returning for his bride. That's the first thing Jesus is going to do. He is going to come and return for his bride. And then after that, the wrath of God will happen, which we will see when the sun goes dark and the moon will give us light. That's when the wrath of God, that's the first thing that will happen. If you look at the Old Testament prophets, that's what they describe. The day of the Lord is horrible. Okay, that's what they're describing. Not only the heavens and the, the, the bodies will, I mean, the heavenly bodies will shake, but there is going to be a horrible, horrible time, okay? Horrible things. Now, if you want to know what happens during the wrath of God, read the seven trumpets of Revelation and read the seven bowls in chapter 16. So chapter 8 through 11 and chapter 16 are describing the wrath of God in detail. And then, of course, after that, after the wrath of God, then the Son of Man will appear again in heaven. But who is going to be with him? And you know what? Um, Matthew didn't, uh, I mean, Jesus didn't describe it right there. Um, he didn't describe that the saints will be with uh, Jesus. But Zechariah 14 did. I think it's Zechariah 14, 5 did describe it. And you can see it there. So, and then after that, Matthew goes into a little more detail about the rapture. But see, the rapture has already happened. This is not chronological. And that's important to know that Matthew is not 100% chronological. He kind of jumps around. Actually, it's not really Matthew. Well, Matthew did kind of the way he wrote it down. But also Jesus didn't really mention and say, hey, I'm going to come back exactly before the sun or around that time when the sun goes dark. The first thing that will happen is, oh, I'm going to come and get the bride. Maybe he didn't want people to know about that. Later on in Matthew 25, he goes in detail about uh, when he comes and picks up his bride. But he doesn't say exactly when he's going to pick up his bride. Okay? We're going to have to be smart enough or have the Holy Spirit to understand when this will happen. But I'm coming to the end right now. My time is up. And please read these things again. They're important. I will also attach this little booklet that you can find for free. Don't be offended who is really um, uh, uh, posting it for free. Just read the little booklet. You can also buy it. Um, I bought it from actually walmart.com. So, and I don't know if they still have it. But, hey, let the Holy Spirit guide you and read these verses again in Matthew 24. Understand, compare it to Luke 21 and Mark 13. Let the Holy Spirit guide you always.